Good morning from St. Vital Park and welcome to our online service for November 22nd. Whether you're on the live stream right now or you plan to watch later in the day or later in the week, we welcome you to worship together. Let's pause for a moment to reflect on the purpose for the church being gathered, whether here in person or online as we do today. We are gathered to worship God the Father, who has given us a living hope of redemption in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit alive in us. This morning's service is a little different than we had planned. We are in a time of continual change and adaptation. We had planned for this morning to be a service of music and testimony with the harpist Edward Clausen, but plans have changed. Instead, we will be blessed this morning and led in worship by Chris and Jody Cragen from their home, and we will be encouraged in the word by Kevin Dick, who is also preaching this morning in LaSalle. Coming up this evening, we have a congregational meeting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, you will have seen a registration link for that meeting in the email this morning or uh, in the newsletter earlier this week. Click on the registration link and once you register, you'll be sent the information to uh, sign into the meeting this evening. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. We are preparing links to some devotionals and readings and activities that will be available on the website, so keep your eyes open for that. And families will be receiving a package of Advent materials and activities from Pastor Ruth in the coming days. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 33. You know, life is a bit of a roller coaster these days, for some of us more than for others. But each day holds potential, potential for blessing and also potential for unexpected challenges. But we serve and bear witness to a God who is bigger than all of it, a God who hears and sees and knows our situation and has the power to act on our behalf. Hear these words this morning from Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let us turn our hearts towards worship and praise this God of hope. Good morning and welcome to worship. Please join us in singing. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and Early in the 
in the morning I will celebrate the light When I stumble in the darkness I will call your name by night God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy Holy, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. 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 Hallelujah to the 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 Lord. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. Precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Father, hold me. speak your truth Lord your truth I seek I'll trust your words not what I see grant me your blessing your grace this day yet not my will but yours I pray may thy will be done as it is in heaven may thy kingdom come Lord, as you give and as you take away, this prayer remains. May thy will, may thy will, may thy will be done. It may get darker before the dawn, yet where you lead, I'll carry on. I know you're able to rescue me But even if you don't, I still believe May thy will be done As it is in heaven, may thy kingdom come Lord, as you give and as you take away This prayer remains May thy will, may thy will, may thy will want to see your kingdom come hallowed be thy name be thy name and through our lives your will to be done hallowed be thy name be thy name may thy will be done as it is in heaven may thy kingdom come Lord, as you give and as you take away, this prayer remains. May thy will, may thy will, may thy will be done. May thy will be done. As it is in heaven, may thy kingdom come. 
Lord, as you give and as you take away, this prayer remains. May thy will, may thy will, may thy will be done. Oh, may thy will, may thy will, may thy will be done. No, oh, may thy will, may thy will, may thy will be done. Every Sunday, we have a focus on our kids and family. The Bible story videos follow the children's curriculum that families are using at home. This week's story will end our look at Moses, and next week, we'll begin with Advent and the birth of Jesus. I was made for this, I live for this, God has a reason, a reason for my life, I'm gonna shout it out, without a doubt, I was born for this, built for a purpose. There is a God who made it all, everything we see. He built the mountains, filled the oceans, and He built me. He's with me, He's for me, I am not alone. He is with me, He is for me, and I know, I know that I was made for this, I live for this, God has a reason, a reason for my life, I'm gonna shout it out, without a doubt I was born for this, built for a purpose. He's with me, He's for me, and I am not alone. He's with me, He's for me, and I am not alone. He's with me, He's for me, and I am not alone. He's with me, He's for me, and I know, I know that I was made for this. I live for this, God has a reason, a reason for my life, I'm gonna shout it out, without a doubt, I was born for this, built for a purpose. blindfold game and put a blindfold on and had a leader guide you through a maze to your destination. Go that might be a good go activity for this afternoon go with right maybe right. a brother and sister or with your parents. Forward. You see, in these kinds of games, there is always a leader or someone Forward. guiding the group. Turn. And you need to follow that down. person in order to be successful. In now, Kid Zone, forward. we've been learning about now, the Israelites, again. God's chosen people, yeah. who escaped from Pharaoh forward, in Egypt, forward. and they're okay. on their way into the promised land. Moses forward. has been leading the Israelites, but for the oh, first the time moon. ever, no, they have a new Jump. leader. You see, Moses has died, and God has appointed Joshua. Check it out. This is Joshua. Hello. Joshua was the leader of the Israelites, oh. who God would use to take his people into the promised land. Yeah, let's do it! Joshua readied his people to cross the Jordan River, which was the only thing dividing the Israelites from the land that God had promised to them. All right! We're here! Okay! They camped beside the river for three days, waiting, just as the Lord had commanded them. 
At this time of year, the Jordan River was flooded and flowing with so much water that it was impossible to cross on foot. And then the Lord said, let there be what? Hey, priest. Yeah. Come on. God told Joshua to tell the people that the priests would carry the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people through the water. He told the priests to step into the rushing waters. What? Huh? And when they would do this, the waters would stop flowing. Uh, all right. And as soon as the priests did this, the water of the Jordan River did stop flowing. Yay! And the priests stood with the Ark of the Covenant on dry ground as the Israelites crossed to the other side. All right. God told Joshua to send 12 men from the 12 tribes of Israel Again. to take 12 stones from the place that the priests were standing. When all this had been finished as God commanded, Joshua called the priests from the Jordan. We're good, come on. As their feet left the Jordan River, the waters came back into place, just as they had been. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They brought their stones to their camp and set them as a memorial, so future generations might remember the story of how God brought his people through the Jordan River on dry ground. to the promised land, finally. If it were me, I'd want to have a party. But instead, someone from each tribe selects a stone from the riverbed and they take them, all those stones, and make a monument or a memorial. Do you know what a memorial is? A memorial is something established to remind people of a person or an event. This is an Anukshuk behind me. An Anukshuk is a stacked stone monument used to mark a sacred space. And in Winnipeg, we have lots of memorials and monuments that were built to honor and remember and celebrate certain people or events. What about you? What helps you remember or mark important events in your life? When the Israelites carried the stones from the riverbed and stacked them up, it reminded them of God's mighty act in drying up the river. See, God was their great leader. Isn't it awesome that he's our great leader too? Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the ways you care for your people. Help us see the ways you guide and help us, just as you guided and helped the Israelites. Watch over us this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye. In the scriptures, it says that as God's people, we offer our lives to him as an offering, a pleasing sacrifice. We do this through our acts of love, service, and charity, through devotion to him, through worship and through witness and also through hospitality and generosity. Thank you for your gifts as you support the work of Fort Gary throughout this year. As we're getting close to the end of the year, we want to meet our ministry plan goals and we invite you to consider how you can contribute to the work of the church. You can give online or by dropping off or mailing your contributions to the church office. Thank you again for your participation in the work of the church. Let us gather together now in prayer as we consider all that God is doing on our behalf. Let us pray together. Lord, we give you praise. We give you praise for the beauty of the world around us, the nature that we see your handiwork in, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, to all generations, your mercy and your grace that is poured out on us again and again. We confess, Lord, that all too often we neglect your presence in our lives. 
You long to be with us, and yet our lives are filled with so many other things. We confess that we, conf we have neglected spending time in your word and hearing your voice. When we are tired and stressed, our thoughts turn to ourselves, and we can lack grace and mercy for others. Forgive us, Lord, for our faithlessness. We rejoice in knowing that you are faithful to forgive and to restore us. Lord, today we come to you with the thoughts and needs that are on our minds. We ask you to sustain our hope in this time of challenge as we see illness and difficulty all around. We lift our eyes to you, Lord. We pray that you'll be with the educators and the students as they face continual changes and challenges in the schools. We pray for the businesses and the workplaces that are affected by the changing restrictions of this pandemic. We pray for the health and well-being of the people in our community and here at Fort Gary as we struggle with uh, with various illness and disease, as we long to be together with people and we sense that separation and isolation from others, we ask for your presence to fill that space and draw us into your presence. Lord, we pray for our leaders, both here in the church and in our community. We ask for wisdom and discernment so that we can choose wisely the path to go. And we pray, Father, that you will help us all along the way. Lord, we come to you and offer again ourselves to your service and to your ministry. Fill us with the Holy Spirit to bless others in our lives, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers. Use our hands and our feet and our voice for your kingdom. And give us unity, we pray, as a body, so that we can glorify you and care for one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be with you and to be able to share a message with you today. Uh, but it's been a, a winding, unexpected journey uh, getting to this point, getting to this Sunday for me, though. Uh, Pastor Carl alluded to this already earlier. Uh, way back in March, uh, we had scheduled a special service for this Sunday. Uh, the special service certainly did not involve me uh, speaking to you today. And I had planned to have an incredible musician. He's a harpist uh, who travels across the country sharing the, the message of Jesus through music and storytelling. And he was going to be with us leading most of the service. And I was so looking forward to hearing from him and having him minister to all of us. But Code Red happened. And to make a long story short, all of the plans that I had previously made with him were just no longer feasible. And so that brings us to the present with me uh, being here in my home uh, to share this message with you uh, this morning. So there's been lots of unexpected in the events leading up today. It feels like we live in a constant state of change, in a constant state of unknown, where there's unexpected that happens repeatedly. Our jobs have changed. Going to school has changed. Our lives have changed. Our communities are changing. And in all of this unexpected change, there's a level of response that we have to make. How do you respond when something unexpected happens in your life? How have you responded recently? What informs you and directs you in your response? There's an Old Testament story that has some incredible insights and wisdom to inform us in these types of situations. And I was reminded of it after reading a book called A Tale of Three Kings. Uh, the book uses a, a method of writing as though one was witnessing a theatrical play, and it outlines the leadership style that King David demonstrated throughout his life, from when he was, uh, before he was a king, during his time as a king, and then towards the end of his reign. It's an insightful book. But the ending left me with several questions about the events of David's life, and so 
I turn to 2 Samuel and to Chronicles to refresh the story of David in my mind. And from that, the Spirit revealed some insights from David's life as it pertains to how he responded to an unexpected message for God and how that can pertain for us and inform us in our life. So we pick up the story in 2 Samuel 6. You can turn there in your Bibles to follow along with, if you'd like. I'll be paraphrasing and, and, and teaching the story in more of a storytelling format today. Uh, David was in his mid-40s, and he had spent the last 15 years reestablishing the kingdoms of Israel and Judah through battle and war. He had just returned to Jerusalem, at which time he had brought the Ark of the Covenant back into the city or into the city of Jerusalem. David exuberantly danced and worshipped in the streets in front of the ark as it was brought to its new resting place that God had designated for it to be. And David declared when the ark made its way to its final spot that from now on, this would be the site for the worship of God. This is the place for Israel's altar of burnt offering. Everything was great in David's world. He was on top of the world. God was with him. He could do no wrong. So before long, King David, he made himself at home in his palace, and God gave him peace from all of his enemies. And then David one day was hanging out with his prophet Nathan, and he says, Look at this. Here I am comfortable in this luxurious house of cedar, and the chest of God sits out there in a plain tent. That is not right. I need to build a suitable dwelling place for the Lord. David is ready to go all in for God here. He is fired up to honor God who had led him in and out of battles, who had given him victory over his enemies, who had been with him as he literally brought the presence of God into Jerusalem. What better response than to build a monument a resting place that generation upon generation could come to bring their offerings to God and experience the presence of God as he himself had experienced God. So Nathan told David, whatever is on your heart, go and do it. God is with you. I can only imagine what efforts David must have made that night toward getting things going and getting things into place to build the temple for temple construction. You know how it is when you get this really insightful idea and you're ready to roll and you're ready to move and things are just churning and things are happening. It feels good. The endorphins are flowing and you want to just go and do. But that night, the word of God came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David that this is God's word on the matter. Tell David that you're going to build me a house, a house for me to live in? Why? I haven't lived in a house from the time I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt until now. All that time I've moved about with nothing but a tent. And in all of my travels with Israel, did I ever say to any of the leaders I commanded, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? God is saying to David here that you think you know what I need? I, the Lord who brought my people out of captivity in Egypt, parting the seas, I, the God who was with you when you slayed a giant and when I gave you victory over your enemies in battle, you think I now need to reside in a place that you have in mind? No, 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 David. I am the Lord God Almighty. You will not be building me the temple in the way that you have in mind. So here is what you are to tell my servant David, God goes on to tell Nathan. The God of angel armies has this word for you. I took you from the pasture, tagging along after sheep, and made you prince over my people Israel. I was with you everywhere you went, and I mowed down your enemies before you. Now I'm making you famous to be ranked with the great names on earth, and I'm going to set aside a place for my people Israel and plant them there so they'll have their own home and have peace. Furthermore, God himself, I myself, God will build you a house. When your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
So David received God's response to his idea. It wasn't anything that he was expecting, especially after he had first been given that affirmative response from Nathan saying, go and do what is on your heart because God is with you. God was changing David's perspective where his perspective needed to be placed from the present idea, David's present idea, to build something in his current time to a future promise that David's offspring would experience. And so we get into the message this morning about what David did to respond. I propose that David responded with wonder, with worship, and with work. Three W's, wonder, worship, and work. Let's continue in the story. 2 Samuel 7, verse 18. Then King David went into the tabernacle and he sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me for this? That you have brought me this. And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Is this your usual way of dealing with people? With man, O sovereign Lord? Notice how David responds after hearing the powerful promises that God spoke to him through Nathan. David goes and he sits before the Lord. David doesn't say, oh, that's interesting, and then he continues with his idea to begin building the temple. David literally postures himself into the wondrous presence of the Lord, and then he moves to ask deep, significant, wondering questions who am I? What is my family? David wonders. So what is wonder? The definition of wonder is that emotion which is excited by novelty or it's the presentation to the sight or mind of something new or unusual or strange. There's an 18th century Scottish philosopher, Adam Smith. He, he, he developed the idea actually about capitalism. It really, it, it doesn't matter. But what he said was interesting. He said that wonder arises when something new and singular is presented, and then there aren't any memories that we have to basically draw up any image that resembles the strange occurrence or idea that is happening. Wonder is when our minds are blown by something completely unexpected. David sat in this unexpected. He sat in wonder and amazement in the presence of the Lord. David was no longer occupied with his own thoughts and plans about the temple building. God was creating new ideas for David to draw on. In this space, David owned his nothingness and he acknowledged what great things God had done for him. God was blowing David's mind with not only completely turning the tables on him about who was going to build who a house, God was revealing David's future, his family's future, and was expanding his mind about what was possible when God is involved. Is a sense of wonder your first reaction when something unexpected comes your way? It certainly wasn't for me. Uh, I can remember a story. I was volunteering at SOAR about six years ago. Uh, I was leading uh, uh, I was doing some leader care, uh, helping to encourage and, and shepherd the, the youth leaders that come with their youth teams uh, for the program. If, you haven't, if you're not familiar with SOAR, SOAR is a discipleship on mission program. It's a 10-day program for uh, youth high school students uh, during spring break. And so uh, I was leading devotionals, listening with people, praying with people, encouraging them. And towards the end of the week, one of the youth leaders came up to me and asked uh, where I was pastoring. And this was at the time when I was still working as a physiotherapist uh, with a ballet. And I just said, you know, I'm, I'm a physio, man. I, I really, uh, this is, I'm just here to encourage and do this. This is just what I'm doing. He says, oh, really? That's, it, just, it just seems like you have, you're so pastoral. And that was kind of like a bit of an aha moment. There was some wonder in that, in that experience. But two weeks later, uh, another youth pastor uh, called me up and he said, Look, can we go for coffee? And so we went for coffee and we got our drinks and we sat down and it wasn't just a few moments into the conversation. He said, you know, Kevin, there's a, a position at our church and I saw how uh, you at SOAR and saw you interacting and doing the things that you were doing there. And I just felt like it was on my heart to ask you to come to our church and, 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 and apply and potentially be my boss. 
And this, I just, my jaw dropped. I don't think that it was wonder. This came completely out of left field. I think it was more shock than anything. I can remember in that moment having zero words. What had just come to me, I had no recollection, no memories. I had no idea that this was coming. And so I guess you could say it was wonder, but I think the wonder came a little bit later on as I spent significant time with God, seeking his guidance and his input and his wisdom. And looking back on that memory, those memories, without that experience, I wonder if I would be in this position uh, speaking to you, delivering a message uh, from God and working in a ministry position here at Fort Gary. Can you think of other examples in the Bible where people take time to sit in God's presence and wonder? Uh, I'm reminded of the demon-possessed man. Uh, I preached about that back in March uh, during Lent. I uh, remember when he was, uh, the, the man was possessed and Jesus came and the man came running to him and Jesus sent uh, the demon legion into the pigs and they went over the, the cliff and the people ran away, but eventually they came back and there they found the man resting at Jesus' feet at peace and rest as he sat before the Lord. Or there was Mary of Bethany. The first thing we read about her in Luke chapter 10 is that she sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. It was the place that she chose and the Lord called it that good part which shall not be taken away from her. The most powerful thing that we can do any day when things aren't going as we might have expected them to go is to sit down in God's presence and be still. When we sit in God's presence and we allow ourselves to wonder with God, we experience his peace and we receive insight and direction for what to do next. So what did David do next? David worshipped. In verse 22, it says, How great you are, O sovereign Lord! There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. So after sitting down in God's presence, David's second response is to proclaim the greatness, the uniqueness, the singularity of God. The word worship comes from two old English compounds, worth, we, we earth, W-E-O-R-T-H, worth, and Skype. Worth means what it sounds like. It's worth or worthiness. And Skype means to ascribe. When you put these together, you get the meaning of worship to ascribe worth. When we ascribe worth to something, we reveal what preoccupies us, what we value, what is important to us. In its most basic sense, when we ascribe worth and when we worship God, we indicate that God is what is important to us and we direct and shape our lives accordingly. These attributes are seen in David as he worships God, proclaiming God's sovereignty and worth in verse 22. David is not allowing his own personal thoughts of building the temple to take center stage any longer. He's valuing who God is and what God has to say more than being preoccupied with his own idea of building a home for God. He places full value on reminding himself of where his place is in the world and how big God is. God is more important to David than anything else and he demonstrates this in his decision to worship in the tabernacle. I'm guessing that many of you have experienced the power and the life-giving attributes of worship at some point in your life, at many times in your life. Beginning in this past September, I've been participating in uh, Multiply, that's our MB conference mission arm. I've been participating in Multiply's TREK program. The TREK program is a nine-month program. It consists of two months of orientation and then five months of a ministry assignment, um, leading people to, to kind of consider a longer-term mission. Uh, I've, I was helping out in, in a leadership role, helping them with some, some tech stuff, but I was participating as well, and so I'm doing some CMU uh, student work in conjunction with that. And there will be some sort of special project coming at Fort Gary that I'll be a part of. Uh, stay tuned for more details on that. So each day at orientation, we would spend an hour in worship. These morning worship times have been so significant for me. They've literally carried me over maybe what was one of the most difficult months of my life as I grieved the passing of my mother uh, back in the beginning of September. 
Uh, just as ministry work was becoming increasingly challenging with constant changes and gathering sizes and COVID statuses and those kinds of things. Uh, and then just be doing these, these two different aspects, track and, and, and Fort Gary, worship coordinator and production coordinator. So what does it look like in your life, in our lives, to ascribe worth to God, not just on Sundays, but every day in each and every unexpected situation that comes our way? Romans 12, 1 to 2 says this. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. This is truly the way to worship God. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. To worship is to submit our whole selves to the ways and wonders of God. We go to God and offer God everything that we have regularly, daily, hourly. Uh, Randy Friesen, who was recently the director of Multiply, uh, he was teaching at Trek and he shared the way that he worships each and every day. He starts his day with this practice and regularly returns to these four ideas uh, four thoughts throughout his day, and I'd like to share them with you because I've, as I've practiced this over the last month or so, I've just experienced the wonder and the power of the Spirit um, as I've been challenged through unexpected circumstances. So Randy uses the acronym PREP, P-R-E-P, -E PREP. So first you proclaim who God is. I find myself singing opening stanzas of song lyrics here, like, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, okay, no more singing. I'll keep that to the shower. Uh, or Jesus Christ, my living hope. Or, or our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven on earth. I'm sure there's song lyrics that would resonate with you. And then after you proclaim the goodness of God's nature, you continue with proclaiming who you are in Christ I am a child of God, I'm holy and blameless, a royal priesthood, an ambassador of reconciliation. I'm sure that you can think of many more attributes and descriptors of who you are in Christ. So first you, uh, in your prep, P, proclaim who God is, proclaim who you are in Christ. Next, repent. Repent of anything that keeps you or us from the glory of God. We repent what we have done or, or haven't done that doesn't reflect our character in Christ. Uh, the third thing is to entreat. What is entreat? This is how you're going to remember this prep because entreat is such a unique word. Entreat means to ask someone earnestly or anxiously to do something. And so we earnestly ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. We ask God to allow the Spirit to do its incredible work in us for that day in that next situation, in that next conversation that we have. We intentionally ask God to allow the power of the Spirit to be at work in us, uh, starting in that first moment when we wake up in the morning. So we've got the P, proclaim, R, repent, E, entreat, and the last P is to put on the armor of God. In Ephesians 6, God... Paul, in Ephesians 6, Paul gives a final word to the church to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And we put on God's protection so that we can stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Uh, what is this armor? It's a helmet of salvation, a belt of truth, a chest plate of righteousness, shoes of peace. It's a shield of faith and it's a sword of the spirit, the word of God. Prep, P-R-E-P. This is one example of a way to worship, and I'm sure there are many. There, there are. There's many ways to worship God. But can I encourage you to make some sort of worship a priority in your life each and every day? When something frustrating comes your way, worship. When a decision doesn't go as planned, worship. Like when you step through that door that, that is open, that God opens for you, but what's on the other side isn't quite what you expected, worship. Ascribe worth to God in everything that you do. And so the last of our W's, wonder, worship, last of our W's is in David's response to God is that he did get to work. 
even though God said David would not be the person to actually build the temple. We know from scripture that David did get to work on preparing to build it. Uh, Solomon, his son, would eventually do uh, the building in chapter 22 of 1 Chronicles. The writer outlines what David actually did do in preparation to build the temple as he is speaking to his son Solomon. David says, by hard work, I've collected several billion dollars worth of gold and millions in silver and so much more iron and bronze that I haven't even weighed it. I have also gathered timber and stone for the walls. This is at least a beginning. It's something from which to you, for you to start. So get to work and may the Lord be with you. And then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to assist his son in this project. So David continued to prepare and plan and work for God's glory to be manifested in the, in the temple, but only when it would be the right time according to God. This promise to David and Solomon was that the temple would be a foretaste of God's abiding presence with his people. Little did David know that the message from God via Nathan had little to do with a physical structure, but was pointing to a, a new temple. 2 Samuel 7, 11 to 16 says, When your life is complete and you're buried with your ancestors, then I'll raise up your child, your own flesh and blood, to succeed you, and I'll firmly establish his rule. He will build a house to honor me, and I will guarantee his kingdom's rule permanently, and your royal throne will always be there. Rock solid. The temple David wanted to build was a picture of how people could relate with God through their purpose their perpetual sacrifices. But in this passage, God is reminding David and us that it was not the house David wanted to build for God that would bring salvation. It was the house that God was giving to David and all of mankind, to you and I. It was Jesus. These words would be made true in the coming of Jesus. Jesus himself would be God's temple the place where God's holiness resides and the place where Jesus calls his people to join him. Jesus would end up doing the saving work that David unknowingly would be connected to as he desired to glorify God. So where's the work for us in this? What work are we called to do? Colossians 3.23 says that whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as though you are working for the Lord and not for people. Jesus, after leaving this earth, invites us to continue his work of establishing and building his kingdom here on earth. We have the opportunity to work to demonstrate the love and the redeeming uh, grace that Jesus commissioned us to do, to go out and make disciples and to establish a kingdom way of life uh, in our own lives and in our own contexts and in our own communities. We are moving into a season of Advent next week. Uh, Can I invite you to put this idea, these ideas of wondering and worshiping and working into action in the coming weeks? This season is not going to look and feel like any other Christmas season. There's going to be the unexpected. There's going to be joys and there's going to be sorrows. There's going to be challenge and there's going to be beauty. How are you going to respond in the unexpected of this Christmas season? So in the coming days and in the coming five weeks, I invite you to wonder and worship and work. Wonder about the miracle of Jesus coming to this earth. Worship God in your day to day, eating and breathing and sleeping life. Consider all that Jesus has done for you through his redemptive work on the cross. For with Jesus, you yourself are the living temple, and God's Spirit dwells in you. Amen. of my wandering and 
never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust. I will trust in you. Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So, in all things, be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains I'm needing you to move When you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers As I cry out to you I will trust, I will trust I will trust in you I will trust in you You are my strength and comfort, you are my steady hand, you are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good, there's not a place where I'll go, you've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. 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 Thank you, Kevin, for encouraging us from the word this morning. As you go today, hear again these words from Psalm 33. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Go now in peace and love to serve our God. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. 
Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you.